Could an up and coming edge group lead the Colts to breaking the franchise's single season sack record? Let's get to it. You are locked on Colts, your daily Indianapolis Colts podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right. What's up, everyone? Thanks for tuning in and making us your first listen of the day. This is your daily podcast covering your Indianapolis Colts, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am Jake Arthur. He is Zach Hicks, and you know the two of us from HorseshoeHuddle.com. I am the resident credentialed media member reporting to you live from the facility throughout the week. Zach is out here crushing it as the number one film guy in the Colts market. I gave him the award. You all gave him the award as well. (laughs) Can't can't take it back now. Yes. Yes. It is definitely an honor. It's an honor for sure. But yeah, guys, on today's show, we're going to talk about the defensive end group. We're going to talk about the starters, the two guys that we expect to start. Then we're going to switch over to some key depth players. And then at the end, we'll close it out with some of the bottom of the roster uh, you know, long shots that, you know, they could still make a chance. They, they still have a chance to make the roster. So we're going to start off with the starters here, Jake. And and I think we're both in agreement that Sanson Abukum is a big upgrade over what they had at the other defensive end spot across from Quiddy mm-hmm. Pay last year, right? Yeah, absolutely. Just because, I mean, and Gakwe, you know, he, he, put, he gives you those sack numbers every year, about eight sacks a year. Uh, but he can go quiet for long stretches. And he's a one-trick pony as a pass rusher offers you very little next to nothing as a, as a run defender. Uh, but a Bukum, you know, you probably don't get, you probably don't get some of the same flashes as a pass rusher, but what you lose there, you make up for immensely in run support. Uh, but also a Bukum has shown some promise as a pass rusher, a uh, pretty consistent disruptor, just probably needs to be more consistent as a finisher. Yeah, I I think one thing that we can't quantify when we're talking about pass rushers that's so important, though, is just how how consistent these pass rushers are in their pass rush lanes, how uh, how much they threaten the edge, how much they keep quarterbacks confined into that small space for players like DeForest Buckner to get their sacks. And I think when you compare Abukum to Yannick Ngakwe, that's really the area where Abukum is just a massive, massive upgrade, because if Ngakwe is not getting a sack, he's not involved in the play. Like he is getting washed out completely. He's getting driven down the line. He's overrunning his arc and quarterbacks are having really easy escape lanes to his side of the field with a you know, he's extremely long, extremely powerful, extremely explosive. So even if he's not going to turn that corner, like a Yannick Ngakwe, or he's going to disengage super well, he's going to be so tight on his arc, or he's going to be so competitive on each and every single rush that that quarterback's going to be confined to such a small space for players like Dio Dengbo, DeForest Buckner, Quiddy Pay to come in and clean up for sacks. So Samson Abukum is one of those guys where he might only have four to five sacks and like 30 pressures in a season, but like every single play is going to be competitive and efficient with him. And that's where he's a massive upgrade over Yaakin Gakwe, where, you know, it's kind of like a, one of those like radar things where it's just going up and down, up and down. Uh, with with Yannick Ngakwe, you're going to get some really high highs and get some phenomenal sacks and and a couple of uh, you know forced fumbles and stuff like that. And you're going to be feeling great at the end of the year looking at the stats, but you'll be watching individual games being like, where is Yannick Ngakwe? <laughs> like this is a player who's going to have near 10 sacks every single season, and he's not having an impact whatsoever on on any given game. Uh, so that's really where the big upgrade is right there. Is just having a player like Abukum who's going to m- consistently make everyone better. Instead of Ngakwe, who's going to consistently make his stat line better. <laughs> That's the best way I could say it there. Yeah, and a, a big a, a big factor you got to put that in, into that is the snap counts. Like, despite not offering everything in every facet of the game, Ngakwe still played a ton of snaps. So now you have a Bukum out there getting, what, 70% of the snaps, whatever. He could probably turn that into a lot more, and it doesn't have to be in terms of pass rush. Like, you can you can get back to where the Colts were a really really good run de- defense under Matt Eberflus. You can kind of get back to that. that. That'll be a really positive development for them. On the other side is Quiddy Pay, and before we dive into that, 
I'd be remiss not to mention your interview, Zach, with uh, Eddie McGilver recently, who trains Samson Abukum, Quiddy Pay, and Dio Dangbo. So this is <laughs> kind of an extension of that episode, really. Um, so after this episode, go listen to that. But Zach, Quiddy Pay, um, we can see a pretty big jump forward in year three. We started to see it in, in year two, had a, a nagging ankle injury that cost him five games. Uh, we still saw improvements. You know, he had 34 hurries on the season, which, again, despite only playing in 12 games, was third on the team behind DeForest Buckner and Yannick Ngakwe. So he was he was being disruptive still, and we still saw some solid performances with the bum ankle. Uh, so if he's going to come into the season at 100%, we could really see a guy who could threaten 10 sacks, 15 tackles for loss. Yeah, I think one thing that's kind of overlooked with Quiddy Pay is just he was so good to start last season. Like, he was really, really playing well. Uh, I think he had two and a half sacks for the first four games, led the team in pass rush win rate, led the team in pressures, uh, was phenomenal in stunts and twists, was getting back there, making his teammates better. He was one of the best run defending defensive ends in the league at that point, too. Like, he everything was clicking early in the year, and it looked like, okay, wow, like, we have Quiddy Pay. We have a really good pass rusher. It's finally clicking. And then that big ankle injury happens against the Denver Broncos. And from that game on, like he had some glimpses there. Like the Patriots game was his best game of the season, uh, which was his first game back after a couple weeks out. Uh, and But the rest of the year, you could see that ankle just wasn't there. He wasn't as explosive. He wasn't as quick or as fluid. Uh, and it really nagged him the whole year. And, and what we talked about with Eddie was, I, I think it was February where he got cleared to work out with, with Eddie. So that was, you know, a couple of months after the season, uh, he was not cleared. He was still not cleared to play uh, or cleared to do anything uh, because of that ankle. So that ankle injury definitely nagged him throughout the year. Uh, and it's kind of tough to project him now because, you're, you're getting a guy where he started so fast and so explosive and so well last year and then had that little dip because of the injury. And so it's kind of like you're hoping for a, a bounce back to what he was early last year instead of him carrying momentum into this next year. Uh, so it's all about the bounce back for him, getting back to where he was early in the season, getting back to where he was late as a rookie where he did have momentum going into his second season. I think he's fully capable of doing that. Uh, he's got one of the craziest combinations of – run defense, athleticism, bend, power, like he's got it all. It's just putting it all together, being healthy, and being the guy we all expect. So it, it's going to be interesting to see what we get from him this year, but I really do expect him to get back to where he was early last season. Uh, he's got the ability. He's got the talent. He's got the the work ethic. It's all about just staying on the field and, and getting it rolling again. Yeah, and of course, defensive line is, is one of the most rotational groups on the field in, in any given game, really. Uh, but you'd really got to like what you see in these two starters. Really high effort, disruptive, strong players who contribute in pretty much every category. Uh, so really good guys there. Uh, but speaking of the next wave, just how good is the Colts' second wave of edge defenders going to be this season? But first, a word from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs ahead of this Heat Nuggets finals. Right now, new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet does not hit. There's no better place to bet all of the playoff action than at America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 or uh, $2,500. Pardon me. That's what it was previously. That's how much of a huge jump this is, everybody. Uh, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. And every day, or just in case you happen to miss it, yesterday we continued our position-by-position position breakdown with this series with the offensive line. So be sure to check that out if you haven't already. All right, Jake. So jumping into the depth uh, at this defensive end group, you know, I think it's it's very intriguing. Uh, and you got two guys. <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Two guys on very We're dying opposite. out here. <laughs> yeah, we're dying. We're old men here, Jake. Uh, but you got two guys on complete opposite ends of the spectrum. You got one guy coming off of just a red hot end of the season last year and carrying that into this next season. And then another guy where ugh, the major injury bug has just continually hit him and hit him and hit him. Uh, and it's kind of getting into a Paris Campbell type of situation where it's like, can we finally get to see this guy on the field? Because he's starting to make progress when he touches the field. But it's like, come on. So we're, we're going to start with him. Let's start with Taekwon Lewis here. Taekwon Lewis, man, the last two seasons has had 
a lot of moments in those first eight games that he's played in each season uh, of looking like the best defensive end on the team. Like he's had some really good glimpses, super explosive. He's finally getting he's finally getting his feet under him when it comes to just disengaging from blocks and the highlights and the flashes are like, wow, like this could be a really, really good pass rusher. Uh, but two major, major injuries in back-to-back seasons, uh, both against the Tennessee Titans, I believe. They both happened in in uh, the same same type of game. Uh, Within but yeah, a year of each other, too. There, yeah. One was Halloween and one was October 30th. Yeah, yeah. So it's just horrible, horrible, horrible circumstances around him. But the Colts, the Colts love him. They brought him back for another uh, another try here. It's hard to expect much out of him, but also at the same time, you're like, we know what he can do and it's pretty good. It's just w- what kind of player is he going to be at this point? You know, like, cause we're not talking mm-hmm. like Paris Campbell. It was just mm-hmm. a lot of, I don't want to say small injuries, but it was a lot of nagging injuries that r- were just hard to recover. And he didn't miss a lot of time, but they weren't like o- outside of the ACL tear. Obviously they weren't like massive, massive, massive injuries, but like Taekwon Lewis, these are like two of the biggest injuries you can have as a pass mm-hmm. rusher. So what kind yeah. of player is he coming back in this next year? That It's just going to be really fascinating to watch. Yeah, that that patellar injury is a career threatener. We've, we've seen it ruin guys' careers and they not be the same after that. And then within a year or so, they're out of the league. And it's happened to him twice now. That's why I had a lot of concern about him last offseason. You know, is he going to be able to be the same guy? And he came out and had probably his best training camp we've ever seen. I was blown away. And then now, unfortunately, it's happened to him twice you know, he has the same timeline to come back as he did the season before because it literally happened, like, to the day. Um, so, I don't know. I'm, I'm interested. He's just kind of a bonus player to me. When you're drawing up the depth chart and everything, you put him on the roster because, you know, he's obviously one of your better defensive players. Um, but it's kind of unfortunate to look at it as when is the other shoe going to drop. You count on him for those however many snaps he's going to be there. He'll give you those couple sacks. Um, again, he he's a he offers a lot of the same things in my opinion as a Bukum and Pay, high effort, explosiveness, contributes against the run and pass, and just just real good solid players that you don't have to take off the field all that often because they can they can contribute in a lot of situations. Um, but at this point, you don't really want to put him over someone you really really want to develop and see what they've got to offer. Like you don't want to put him over Dio. Because again, you're you're taking away snaps from a guy who you probably don't have in your long term plans. Uh, but again, bonus player, he's going to be a lot better than many, you know, second wave defensive ends that teams are going to throw out there. So I'm all for it. Again, anything he might else be better can. though. Like that's a, sorry, might. I didn't mean to interrupt, but he might yeah. be better. It, it's like you don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's hard, man. It's it's this is why injuries just suck though, because like. Mm-hmm. I, I, I want to completely agree with you. And I just want to be, you know what? Taekwon Lewis is a really good rotational guy to have a rotational guy on the interior and on the edge. Uh, but just like last year, it's, it feels like whatever concerns you had last year going into last year's camp being like, Oh, will he come back? You have to like double those concerns now. Oh, absolutely. It's back to back. Is it in the same leg too? It's different knees. Okay. different Which, knees. Is, which is even but... more bizarre. Cause it's a rare injury. Yeah. It's a career threatener and he's had it within a year to different knees. Like that's so crazy. Yeah. It, it's so hard. It's, it's like, he's like almost like an underdog story now where it's like, I just want to see him get back to where he was because he's a, he's a good player. He's a really good player to have. Like, uh, and I don't even mean it just for the Colts perspective here. I mean it for his perspective. Like I just want to see him finally be able to put it together. I'm glad the Colts keep giving him chances, you know, to, to come back from these injuries and see what he can do. Uh, I just hope it doesn't end in, you know, another, titans game halfway through the year where he's tearing another another thing in his knee like it's it sucks man it, injuries suck but I, i'm with you when you say that he's kind of like a bonus player and he's i mean a, alongside drew ogletree i think he's the biggest wild card of this entire roster he could be a player yeah. that plays 300 snaps for you this year and gets four or five sacks and you're like wow okay there we go good productive player or he could be a player that doesn't make the team because the injury is stacked up and and he just did not have a good camp like it, it, there's so many just a just a really wide range of outcomes when it comes to Taekwon Lewis and I'm really 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 hoping it's on the high end this year because it just it sucks seeing this happen to players and and I hope he can get back to where he was yeah for sure again it, he's a great guy he's a great locker room presence 
and the Colts obviously like him enough to keep giving him these one year deals to come back and just see what he can he can bring. Uh, but moving on to your other guy, I don't know if you have much to say about Dio Dangbo just based on your clothing choices or anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, this is a guy, like you said, he was red hot to end last season. Uh, his rookie season was basically a red shirt, but not, it was a, give him some snaps and see what happens. Cause he was coming off an Achilles tear in January, uh, that, that season preparing for the senior bowl. And so he obviously set, you know, new career highs across the board last year. Cause he got a lot more playing time, uh, but five sacks, five tackles for loss. He's that Tasmanian devil type of player. Uh, did you see him starting to become more under control and putting it a little bit together? Yeah, it was getting there. I mean, I wouldn't say that the numbers perfectly aligned with his play late in the year because if you just look at the numbers, I think it was like of those five sacks, it was like four and a half of them came after like week 10. Like he was on fire when it came to sacks late last season, but a couple of them were, you know, like a play fake. Like I think the, the one against the chargers, for instance, like Justin Herbert had a play action bootleg and, and dial ran him down. Uh, there was another one, I think against the Eagles where it was a play action bootleg and he ran him down. So they weren't like super clean pass rush wins that resulted in sacks, but you could see glimpses uh, in, in some of the other games that uh, there was a phenomenal clip against Zach Martin uh, where he gave Zach Martin all he could handle and, and knocked him around a little bit and got some pressure on the quarterback. Uh, you could see on some stunts and twists. You could see the athleticism coming in. You could see him finally understanding the space of the NFL, which I think is such a big thing when it comes to being a pass rusher in the NFL compared to college is in college, you could just overpower everybody. You really didn't have to worry about your specific steps. You didn't have to worry about, you know, your timing on your hands. You didn't have to worry about certain things like that, the spacing and, the, and just the minute details of being a good pass rusher where it feels like Dio is, is steadily getting there. He's getting there. He's understanding how to counter. He's understanding how to separate himself from other pass rushers and other offensive linemen when he's facing them. Uh, and he's really understanding how to get into the backfield and create pressure. So I'm excited to see that next step for him. And and kind of like, unlike Quiddy Pay this past season, where Quiddy Pay started hot, finished cold for obviously a real reason, but finished cold, and he has to kind of bounce back going its next year. It's it's more so for Dio that he started a little slow got red hot late in the year and now he's carrying all that momentum into this off season uh, in a really big off season for him. So I think the projection is, is going really well for him. And I think if he can just ride this hot streak throughout the off season and into the beginning of the year, it wouldn't shock me to see him maybe splitting some time even with Abukum and, and, and uh, Quiddy pay on the outside because he's got the talent. He's got the ability. He's got the size. He's got the, you know, everything that you're looking for. It's just putting it all together completely. Uh, still a really young player as well. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really high on Dio Dangbo and I think this could be a huge year for him. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I don't, you don't want to see him playing because Quiddy or, or a Bukum are hurt, but you want to see him getting a lot of snaps regardless. Something interesting they could do. I think Doug Farrar just wrote about this, you know, some trends that are kind of dominating the NFL or they're kind of getting a lot hot, a lot hotter the five man front, you put Dio up there with that and you can, you know, just see what happens. Cause that could be interesting. I'm putting Dio with a Bukum and, and Quiddy pay and Buckner, you know, on the same line at the same time, that, that could be some fun. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, if you were going to do a bare front with this, with this uh, group, you would probably have a Bukum at the auto position that stand up mm -hmm. Sam linebacker. Uh, then you'd have Dio and Quiddy as the bookends, and then obviously Grover and DeForest on the inside. So, you know, Gus Bradley That's has a nasty done. front, man. Yeah. Well, they've done it in the past. You know, they did it back with uh, the Seahawks back in the Legion of Boom days. They had Bruce Irvin standing up as that that stand up auto off the edge. Uh, so you could certainly see the Colts doing a little bit of that with someone like Samson Abukum, who kind of has that flexibility to to stand up a little bit. So. Yeah, they could they could do some bare front stuff this year for sure. We didn't really see any of it last year, but that could have been you know like a personnel thing. Uh, so we'll we'll see what they can do with that. But yeah, no bare fronts. Bare fronts are exciting, man. I do love bare fronts. Yeah, I mean Gus can do a lot more tweaking now in year two, and he's he's got a lot more fun options to work with. I think. Yeah. Uh, but next up, why an intriguing day three rookie draft pick could wind up making the opening day roster. Up next. All right, Zach, so there's a few guys here on the bubble. A couple of them, I think, have a legit shot to really make it. Uh, you're looking at Khalid Kareem, who was a free agent that the Colts signed uh, about midway through the season, I believe. And then they re-signed him. Uh, you've got Rashad Berry, who I believe is kind of, kind of a designated pass rusher type, if I remember correctly, out of Ohio State. 
And then you've got Titus Leo, the rookie. Man, I know you wanted to talk about him a little bit. Another <laughs> athletic guy, kind of undersized, I believe. Um, but, yeah, do you see – number one, I guess, do you see any of these guys making it? Because Kareem is more of a strong end. Barry is your rush end. Leo is probably – fittingly a Leo, if you had to guess. Uh, but what do you see from this trio here? Yeah, so it, it really depends, again, what kind of flavor they want with their fifth defensive end. You know, do you want more of a strong run defender who's going to give you almost nothing whatsoever in the pass rush? That's Khalid Kareem. You know, do you, if you want that as your bottom guy, uh, you could go for that for sure. If you want more of a designated pass rusher who's still going to play on the end, you go Rashad Berry. If you want a guy who is going to give you good special teams ability, plus the ability to stand up and play some off ball at times and come in and rush off the edge. Then you go Titus Leo. Now for personally, for me, I'm a big Titus Leo fan when it comes to this, this competition for the fifth defensive end. If, if they end up keeping five, I know they typically do keep five, but it could vary with what happens at defensive tackle and stuff like that. Uh, but Titus Leo, I think, I think it kind of meshes well with what you were just saying at the end of the last segment with that bear front, you know, Titus Leo is a guy who kind of fits that Bruce Irvin type of mold where he can stand up and be that stand up auto, but he can also rush off the edge and get his hand in the dirt and, and be a really effective pass rusher, uh, super long, super athletic. Uh, and then also a really, really good special teamer. I think he had, I want to say he had five block punts in college or blocked uh, block kicks, sorry, block kicks. Uh, I don't know if that is just off field goals or if that's off punts as well, but I did read a scouting report that it was like four or five block kicks in his college career. Mm -hmm. uh, those super long arms definitely play a factor into that. His explosion plays a factor into that. So at the very worst, your fifth defensive end or fifth, whatever you keep him as, he can be an off ball linebacker even, uh, is going to be a good special teamer. Uh, so I think Titus Leo has a good shot at making the roster, especially over these other two guys, uh, just for that special team's ability you know, overall, but also because he's a young guy with some pretty good upside as well. And we've mentioned it here before. When it comes to those small school guys, uh, he was Wagner, I believe, right? Because him and Chris Williams. Okay. Yeah, so Wagner, obviously a small school. A lot of you probably haven't even heard of it. <laughs> um, you want to see if they look unnatural, just like better than everybody else on film. And something like that shows that they're, you know, they have something that sets them apart. And that kind of makes me think he does have a better chance of making the roster. Uh, cause new special teams quarter, Brian coordinator, Brian Mason, uh, his special teams units have gone bonkers on blocking kicks. Cincinnati, uh, not, didn't really get started at, uh, Notre Dame quite yet, but no, he, just wherever he's been, those units have been really disruptive in terms of blocking kicks and, and things like that. And if that's an area that he specializes in, as we all know, bottom of the roster guys, special teams is where you make it. So that's, yeah. uh, that's, that's really interesting. Keep that in mind for, uh, for training camp. So Zach, before we close out, I have a couple, I guess, either ors for you. So we both know that Quiddy pay and Dio Dangbo are both kind of on the edge of something big coming up. Right. So, to scale, keeping in mind that Quiddy Pay is going to be like a full time starter, who do you see having the bigger breakout or taking like the bigger step forward uh, between Dio and Quiddy? Health, health, you know, no health issues, of, of course. Yeah, yeah, um, it's tough because I could I could see an argument for either one of them. Uh, I think they're both just so so athletic and so hardworking that either of them could take that massive step forward. I think as of right now, Quiddy Pay is further ahead. And in terms of just being able to disengage from blocks, in terms of being effective off the edge. Uh, and we saw early, like early last year, Quiddy Pay was better than late last season, Dio Dangbo, if that makes sense uh, for all of you guys listening. I thought Quiddy Pay early in the season looked like a legit top 20 pass rusher in the NFL. Like he was really, really good. Uh, and then obviously the injury kind of derailed that. With Dio Dangbo, it was very opportunistic with flashes, which was kind of like what Quiddy Pay showed at the end of his first year. You know, instead of where Quiddy Pay took that next step uh, this past season. So I'm going to go Quiddy Pay just because I think he's further along and he just needs to get that that confidence back after the injury. And if he can just regain what he was doing early last season, he could really threaten the edge and, and bend the corner a little bit better. Like, I think Quiddy Pay is closer to breaking out. But that being said, Dio Dangbo is younger. Dio Dangbo is healthy. He's been healthy this whole offseason and he's riding a hot wave into this offseason. It would not shock me in the slightest for him to come out just exploding on the scene uh, this next year and being, you know, 
uh, a massive impact player for the team. But I'm going to lean Quiddy Pay right now. I think he's closer. I think he showed some better things on film last year. But I think both of those guys are on the precipice of a big breakout season. It's just which one or, you know, if both of them, you know, had that big step forward. And keeping that in mind, you have two guys who are expected to take that jump. You have a Bukum who is, should offer more consistency. DeForest Buckner is DeForest Buckner. Grover Stewart, you know, got better in a lot of areas last year, including pass rush. He's still working on that. The Colts felt two sacks shy last year of breaking the franchise's single season sack record. Uh, they had 46 sacks. Uh, this is the Indianapolis era. They had 46 sacks in 2005, finished with 44 last season. Do you think they can they can top that this year? I think they will top last year's pressure percentage and overall pressures for sure. I think they'll have a lot more pressures and a lot more. They'll be a lot more active in the backfield. It's just when it comes to getting sacks, the two biggest things that that go into that are luck <laughs> and if the team against you is throwing the ball more. Uh, so if the Colts offense is actually able to score some points next year and the team against them has to throw the ball a little bit more, more sacks will come. And then will they have someone like Yannick Ngakwe where if the quarterback's near them, for some reason, they just swallow the ball and they take that sack because <laughs> Yannick Ngakwe always gets the sack no matter what's happening. Uh, that one sack per game, whatever it was late in the season. Uh, it really comes down to that, though. Like, Will things bounce their way? Will things? Uh, will the other teams be throwing the ball a little bit more? I think it's very feasible that they do break that they do break that record. Uh, I, I think this is going to be the best group unit that I've seen in Indianapolis. I've I've been covering the team since 2018. I think this is the best like cohesive pass rush unit because when they get those four guys out there, Dio, DeForest, um, Abukum, and Quiddy, uh, I think all four of those guys complement each other so well. And you have three guys that are really good team pass rushers and then DeForest Buckner, who's a great star pass rusher. I think all four of them are going to be the best pass rushing like group of four that the Colts have had since 2018. Uh, but yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to luck. And I think there are a lot of ways where they can break that record. So for the sake of this conversation, and so I can have something hot takey, I guess, I will say, yeah, they'll beat that 44 uh, that they had last year. And I think they can they have a good chance of beating that 46 for sure. I like it. I, I thought they were I thought they were gonna do it last year. They were so close. Last game was Houston. So you would would, well, would have thought they could do it. Uh, but no, I, I like what you said about at least they'll have more pressures, more, you know, win rate, things like that. That makes a lot of sense. Um all I all I really care about is more consistency, I guess. Like yeah, they've they've just had those times over the last few years where they could have five sacks one game and then for the next two weeks have one or two quarterback hits like yeah you just got to clean that stuff up it may not result in sacks but pressures and disruption is very valuable in itself so yeah and that's the thing last year too there were games last year where the colts would finish with four sacks but three hurries and no quarterback hits and it's like mm -hmm. okay you disrupted them on six or seven snaps which is great like six or seven pressures in a game is, is you know it's fine like it could be worse uh, but like i'd rather see 10, 11 hurries in a game or 10, 11, 12 hurries in a game compared to four sacks and no hurries, you know, like sacks are great. Sacks are drive killers. They end the drive, but get that constant pressure, get the quarterback off their spot, get the quarterback thinking about that pass rush. That's the most important thing a pass rush can do. Uh, obviously sacks, again, they're drive killers. They're huge, but I want to see more consistency from this group. And I do think they have a really good group of team pass rushers alongside one star pass rusher and DeForest Buckner. So I think they can, they definitely can break that record. It's just, will they have the luck to where, you know, the three or four times a season where the quarterback's throwing it as their hit, did the quarterback end up eating it? Is it a fumble or do they actually throw the ball in the ground and it doesn't count as a sack? That's really where these records get broken and, and, and stay the same. But every day is, I have a big announcement for you guys. We'll be moving to just three episodes a week going forward for the next two months, uh, June and July. We'll be doing three episodes a week. Now, don't get me wrong. We'll still post a couple of other bonus episodes and we'll still do some stuff like that. But for the most part, we're going to be three episodes a week going forward. So we hope you every day or stay with us. Uh, I guess every other day or is what we'll call you now <laughs> the rest of the off season here. Uh, but once the, the training camp picks up and the pads go on, we will really be going back to five a week. Like we might go five a week a little earlier than, than uh, August for sure. But if you guys don't already make sure you're following us on social medias at locked on Colts at Jake Arthur NFL and at Zach Hicks too. also subscribe to locked on Colts podcast on YouTube. 
wherever you listen to your podcast. We love your guys' ratings, reviews, and we'll see you guys bright and early next week.